So, welcome to the StatsBomb Live podcast. Uh, there are a number of things going on here. One is that this is the first time the three of us have ever done this together, uh, which, is, uh, which is a little new. Also, uh, we usually talk about and analyze football on this podcast, and one of the difficulties and, and things that are kind of constantly in our minds is we need to be a little careful about criticizing potential customers or current customers and even like discussing that. And I don't know if you've seen a lot of the people that have been in and around the conference today, but we've certainly never done that in a room full of these people who actually work for these clubs. So uh, we, we're like listing off the clubs that we can't talk about. I've we got, will still talk about them. I've got a feeling most of them have gone to the bar. So. I, yeah, yeah. It's, it's cleared out a bit, which is, which is great. Merciful, really. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's just for the people at home now. So we're actually in the clear. We're going to pretend we're by ourselves. But one of the bigger things about this particular podcast is that Ben's here. And, and Ben is one of the original co-founders of StatsBomb. He's also one of the, the early innovators of the analytics movement in, in soccer and football. Uh, my writing started out on, on the site that your brother ran for Manchester City That's on, right. what was it, SB Nation That's back right. in the day? Bathroom Blue. Yeah, yeah so, uh, so that'd be Danny Pugsley. Hi, Danny. Um, and so it actually, it felt really right to me that we got Ben here to, to be part of this because <sighs> you and I started the silly podcast right. because they bugged us. <laughs> That's correct, and then it's, it's strange how it revolves from one silly podcast to, to coming here today, but this is the exciting thing about me coming here today. We started this a long time ago as a, as a small website, trying to do things a little bit differently in a different kind of way. So to come back, you know, I don't live in England anymore, so come back to England to see StatsBomb and to see it as a big conference, it's amazing for me. It's, it's, it's going from A cool. to B, you know, so it's incredible. Yeah, so uh, this, this may be a little navel, navel gazy. Uh, hopefully you guys have had very, very great objective discussions today, but like we're going to talk a little bit about like stats bomb itself. Uh, and you know, there were like all of these early people that were involved that many of whom like went into football clubs and then plenty of them transitioned out of football uh, jobs into jobs that paid better or were less stressful or had more objective people or worked with less crazy people. I don't know. There were reasons. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, I think I'm going to shut up now and we're going to let James lead this. But also one of the things about this was we have zero prep. <laughs> I've, got, I've got four or five lines written somewhere diary. on one of these pages. <laughs> Which if you've listened to the StatsBomb podcast over the years, you know that zero prep is not quite our MO, but it frequently is. No, it's, it has been a tradition for sure. I mean, like obviously you, you used to do the podcast with Ben uh, you know, back in the day, going back to like 2013, I think it started. And I remember listening to it. This is my unique experience. I remember listening to it and waiting for the podcast to come out and being really quite excited about a new stats one podcast because it was just fascinating really? talking about stats and football. <laughs> yeah, I read Benji. Benji's here in the front row, <laughs> and Benji complains when we don't release a new yeah, podcast. Yeah. yeah, and then uh, it's really quite a, in ways it's quite a surreal experience to actually like if, you know transition throughout the whole. I actually ended up on the podcast. Me and Ben did it for a while. Well, Ted was still working in football when he was um, you know directing for Brentford and was very quiet, didn't say so much <laughs> back in those days. And me and Ben picked it up, and then uh, you know. When later on, uh, me and Ted kind of kept it going, and it's got it's got ever pop, ever more popular over the years. Um, you know, we get more listeners now than ever before. Uh, we did transfer grades at the start of September, so yeah, you know, Ted talks about upsetting clubs. It's like, well, yeah, if you listen to that podcast, there's one or two on there. If you work for a club, don't listen to that one, okay? I actually do listen to it. Take, take our advice. Be smart. Make good decisions. I mean, that's, that's but th all right. So that's like a great point to to talk about. Like, there are lots of things that have changed, and and we have some perspective on that. But like, do you think that the quality of transfers has, has developed since we were talking about it in 2013 and Manchester City actually were one of the big targets that we kind of beat up for yeah, various reasons? that's right. I think they probably have over the course. You know, we're obviously going to vary between certain clubs, aren't you? But you look at the overall <laughs> kind of curve of transfers and you would like to think they've got better. I think someone pointed out on Twitter the other day, I think it was the average age of clubs. And I saw a tweet that was the last five seasons, you know, and the, during the last two seasons, the average ages. I don't know, it was 26.5, significantly lower. Don't tell them. <laughs> These are old aging girls. This is really old work, right? Aging yeah, yeah. Simple, it is. simple, it, applicable it was, work, right? It was almost unique at the time. Yeah, yeah. And there were plenty of people that followed after it, but you and I both hit, hit on that at various points. And we were talking about like City spending a bunch of money on 28-year-olds. Yeah. We were like, look, what's the point? Like, you've got them on five-year deals. You might get two good years out of them. Yeah. But like everything that we see in the data from tucking into it for like the first time, 
And, and that's actually been part of the fun. Like you used to get to tuck into things for the first time, or one of the first times, was, was that like, you know, the aging curve certainly isn't out at 28 onward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're like, oh yeah, but Berbatov, but Drogba. Of course, but these are the exceptions, right? And I think with the season you're talking about was 2013, 14 with Man City when it was Navas and uh, Negredo and people like that. Yeah. And I think my argument was being a Man City fan, I was trying to defend it in a kind of way. I was like, this is very much win now. And it was, and they won that season, and then spent the next three seasons trying to shift those contracts. I, I, I don't out think of that club, I don't yeah. think that had any any negative uh, consequences, including in Pep's first season. I think that that no, city did just it's fine. Smooth, right? Absolutely. So, but yeah, definitely sign really old fullbacks. Like that. that oh, yeah, that's that, one that, of the, that definitely wasn't an issue, right? So, <laughs> certainly, something that we advise teams is is find the oldest good fullback that you can and and get them on a five year deal. Yeah. Use this okay. He's a fullback now, right? He's a something. <laughs> <laughs> he's, got, he's got a new long contract, bless him. I think, I, I mean, I've read yeah, that, that was, so we, I think the answer to the question is we see a lot fewer dumb oh, transfers, yeah. especially in England. And I think England, almost a little bit to my surprise, is England has been one of the forerunners in adopting the analytics movements. And it helped a little bit that Liverpool were really smart and really successful and talked a little bit about that in the last year. But I think the bigger part it, that helps and things that we found surprising is that teams read our stuff and a lot of the research, whether it's ours or others, was in the English language. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. It was, it was easily findable. Yeah, you know, there wasn't anything that was particularly overly complicated to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> Lost it. Uh, overly complicated and you know you could you could apply these but I definitely agree with you with Liverpool it's almost like you need that you know you go back to the old money ball kind of it wasn't quite true but having the Oakland days outperform massively will have, will have done wonders there and so obviously now we're seeing this with Liverpool and we're going to continue to see it for the next couple of years as well the way their squad is set up that you're going to see a success story that is kind of married a little bit to using data and hopefully this will seep through to other clubs and make I less used to, dumb I, I used to write decisions. an article at the end of each season I think I did three in total and it was uh, just being critical about various signings that haven't worked out, which is, of course is you know, very rude of me to <laughs> use complete hindsight and you know be critical at that point. But that's uh, why we did the transfer grades. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. that we can then we are, we are as, this as year, all of sure. these, these good tra transfer but signings it, work out. It certainly got harder as uh, you know year on year to actually like go through and find uh, deals with them in the Premier League that were you know so obviously kind of like erroneous from the very start and. Um, yeah, you know, the, I think the last time I wrote that was maybe 2017, and you know, they, it feels like the transfers have got like, you know, more kind of, more considered over time. Uh, you know, certainly in the Premier League, and I think yeah, English football uh, in many ways is probably like the kind of uh, the leader in towards kind of like accepting like smart ideas around football and um, insofar as transfers go, and it probably goes deeper in English football than uh, in other countries. Uh, you know, something that we've learned as a business, I think. That, you know, the depth of interest in like analytical ideas, you know, goes quite a long way. I think America would probably be a little further along, but the budgets are just very different. Yeah, no, so that, you know, that's that's all, always a point. Yeah, America very happy to talk data, very happy to talk stats, and very happy to, you know, be involved in you know the ideas that we've always espoused. I think Adrian's presentation and, and what, a question that he was asked at the end. So Adrian Tarascon did a presentation earlier. Uh, it was absolutely dynamite, uh, talking about how they take you know, data and analysis and work through the game phases and then get that down to the training pitch and even, you know, how they help provide information to the players and stuff like that. But one of the things that he was asked about was, you know, how do you, how do, you do this on when you don't have PSG's resources? And he's like, actually, our team that does this is quite small, uh, which, you know, people would find surprising, but, you know, different clubs spend money in different ways. And we've kind of long-term said, just take the available research and apply it. Like right. figure out how to apply it is, is often the tougher bit because a lot of people now have done the hard work on figuring mm. out you know, what matters to some extent. I mean, there, there's still plenty of work to be oh, done. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, I, I found that, that interesting. And, and you know, for a team like PSG, they're like, you know, find the actionable insight, make it simple, get the message right, mm. and, and you know, make sure that the coaches understand it and they can work with it. Yeah, but I guess that's the, the nature of how dynamics work within clubs, right? We saw Javi give a great presentation here, you know, the head of uh, innovation for Barcelona hub, you know, but you still occasionally see Barcelona sign 
the 31 year old Arturo Vidal or someone Shh. like that. It's still, sorry, actually, he, Barcelona guys. He, he's going to get I, on a flight. I'm all right. So you, okay. guys, you guys still work in the company. I'm a little bit separate here, so maybe, <laughs> yeah. I, can, maybe I can make the joke. So. You're the man um, in Barcelona. You yeah, know, exactly. You've got the inside track. Ben's um, an outsider, despite having been there since the beginning. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, you, you are still going to see that. And that's about the dynamics within a club and how things can be applied and the management structure. And, are people giving good advice and showing people good research? Are they going to get listened to? Is it going to be applied at the first team level or the, the director of football level? And I guess that's a challenge for a lot of clubs, right? You can have, you can Almost have smart, everyone. Yeah, you can have smart ones, you can have smart research, you can all be there, can all be stacked there. How is it going to get applied? Are the right people going to get listened to? And that's, that's the next wave of challenges. And can we get the coaches to buy in? And I think that, like, singularly is the hardest thing. Uh, I talk to, to people who are going to buy a club. I talk to people in different... Uh, different sports and, and it is a constant question of like and right now football is very transitional like when a nut, another generation of coaches comes through like five years from now like, I think you'll find a lot more openness to it and, and that's another thing that's changed a ton over, over the last five six years is when we first started publishing stuff it was mostly to an analytics community that was very interested and very passionate about it but also you know the, there's a very skeptical public uh, media generally wanted nothing to do with it. Often media is like slightly terrified of it. And even now we see like pretty poor stats usage in, in various areas of the media, despite like a lot of people trying to like guide them along because it's just not their, their expertise. Right. But one of the things that, that we used to do, like all three of us, we'd follow like who followed the, the main stats bump account. You know, like, oh wow, this guy. Oh yeah, wow. There are a lot of teams that are starting to follow us. Like this is, this is kind of weird. And, and that has happened with the podcast, too, unexpectedly. We have had tons of unexpected, moderately <coughs> famous, or quite influential people that have followed the podcast over the Billy. years. Yeah, it's pretty scary. <laughs> Billy, Billy, I don't remember back in the day, Billy Bean was the one. When we were told very early on from doing a podcast, we had no idea what we're doing. There was zero prep going into it. We were just kind of riffing like we are now. And then I think you got a message from someone saying, yeah. Billy Bean listens so, every week. So, and it so was a like, journalist oh. uh, did, a, did an interview with Billy, and, and they, you know, it was partly about how Billy Bean really likes football. And I'd had no interaction with him at all. And, and I just got a message saying, oh, did you know that Billy Bean listens to your podcast? And I was like, get the fuck out of here. Yeah. <laughs> that, was a, that was a bit nerve-wracking the next time we recorded a podcast, knowing that he's going to be listening to this. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I had initially wanted to play, like one of our fans actually did the scene with uh, Brad Pitt getting in his, his car, putting in the CD, and in the movie Moneyball, uh, or not the money, but in the movie Moneyball, uh, his daughter's song comes out. But in the, in the updated version, it's this man. <laughs> well, hello and welcome to the Stats One podcast. It's me, James York. <laughs> that was right. Oh my god. That was good brilliant. fun. Yeah, I mean, you know, these, you get these little little kind of kicks along the way. I can remember writing. You know, I mean, I, I, the way I came up was like just writing articles. Eventually, Ted said, you know, stick them on the site. Then he said. I remember you used to be like getting me to be managing editor in this space of like one DM in about thirty <laughs> seconds and announcing it like it's, you know, it's not my fault. You're easy. James is now <laughs> <laughs> managing director. I'm sorry, managing editor. I promote myself. I also managing, fired you. <laughs> yeah, he did fire me, and he got Mike to do it instead. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, just, just the, the funny little world that you kind of like uh, we've grown up in. Like when you, you get your first retweet or someone like Gab Marcotti, who's obviously been here today, and you know he's read, read your article and he's retweeted it, and it's like. Oh, that's so cool, you know. You never thought that would happen in a million years when you just sat at home writing articles about stats and football. And you know, we've all kind of been through that same journey. And it is kind of it's kind of funny to see where we are, like, you know, on like for me it's been about five years, for you guys it's six or seven years, and just to see how the you know everything's evolved over time. And um, yeah, man, we're football professionals now, Ted. You've been you're a veteran football professional now. I uh, so <laughs> people often ask me, like, how do I get a job in football? And my answer yeah. is, is almost universally. I don't know. I've only had one job in football, and then I had to start my own company in order to keep working in football. So if you're looking for somebody that has like a large sample size and useful information, yeah. it's probably not me. What, the flip side is we do? hire a lot of people. Yeah, yeah I, I had to be hired by you. Yeah. That's, that's how I got into it. You know. So, so, so how do you get a job in football? Yeah, I got to know Ted. Ted is year dot for quite a lot of things. Yeah, just, me, just DM Ted constantly, basically. <laughs> You'll love that. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> Yeah. Definitely LinkedIn messaged me and asked me for a five-minute conversation. That, that one makes me really happy. Um, <laughs> sorry, we'll move on to less in-jokes at some point. No, we won't. This is our podcast. Yeah, this is all exactly. that we do. Mo uh, movies, no. no. Uh, speaking of, of jobs, though. 
I watched, I watched Baywatch quite recently. <laughs> the Baywatch movie. I was going to film. Are we, we, we going to do I a mean, film section? No, it was, no, it just him. All who right. Likes, who likes? You know, everyone likes The Rock in a film. The Rock's good at good entertainment. Yeah. Zac Efron too, right? Do you want, yeah. A little, little bit singing and dancing. Did I you, can't say I liked it. But did you lose I have a bet? Actually seen it. Did you lose a bet to have to watch that? It's <laughs> show, it just came on. I mean, I don't know. Oh, dude, like I'll, I'll take 1980s comedies for 2000. Yeah, uh, I, do all right I, I was trying to say we have lots of open jobs, and so if you're out there in internet world or potentially in the room. Uh, and have one of the skill sets of the jobs that we are looking for, we are hiring. And one of the things that we definitely predicted, and each of us almost individually, but then as a, as a core, said that this is gonna happen, you know? Like, it's gonna start to take off. And I think that if you look at the attendees, which we aren't publishing and we don't do, um, if you look at the attendees who are here today, like even from just the club side, but especially the ones who are sort of quietly watching, it has changed. It's not like it, it is changing. It has changed. There isn't an argument right now about whether this is useful. The smart clubs know it's useful, and they are using it, and they hire fucking particle physicists <coughs> to come in and help them find better ways to use it. And Javi is, has a, a PhD in AI, you know? Like, these are people who, who definitely could be working at Google and Amazon and Facebook and whatever, and they just happen to be in football because they love that. And, and you know, Vasa, her, her work is so groundbreaking and so cool, and, and Twitter just, like, lit up. They're like, holy shit, this is amazing. And it's practical, yeah. though. Like, it, it's not just, like, pie-in-the-sky nonsense. It's not even, like, black box stuff. It is, oh, we measured this, we science the shit out of it, we then create... I, apparently, IX have good goalkeepers over a number of years. Like, yeah, like, this was amazing to me. Like, it was so obvious, the, the, angle of the, the angle of a jump for a goalkeeper, just to change it from 75 to, you know, whatever it was, 95, uh, you know, so you're not having that gravity to jump up and to I, going across. That I felt so like simple, Paul Riley. Like, Paul Riley might have been on stage there. So Paul Riley is a, is a long-term grump, uh, but has been in and around the football analytics community, basically since the beginning. Uh, the authority. Uh, and I felt like Paul Riley would have either been rolling over like, uh, rah, 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 or, wow, this is awesome. And I'm pretty sure you think it's awesome because yeah, like, he does like science and he loves goalkeepers. All right, James, you apparently pre prepped some stuff, right? Like, should we go through? I well, think, I, I thought it would be fine because... Are like, we have you, time yet? You, you two are both, like, incredibly good talkers, so I just kind of, like... Are you just going to sit quietly, and, right? And stay, so I haven't really, you know, I haven't it, really got that many plans. Can I translate that? You two are generally <coughs> full of shit. Is that no, what that no, means? No, you're good talkers. This, this is a podcast <coughs> for mature audiences only. O occasionally, Ted tries, tries, to, tries to expand the podcast and get, and you get guests, get new people. I'm thinking, like, yeah, but, like, I, I like the talkers. The talkers are good. You've got to be a talker. You have to be able to communicate like freely and fluidly. And, Emma's uh, a talker. Yeah, that exactly. Was yeah, exactly. I mean, these these are good people. These are the people you want on stage. These are the people you want on your podcast. So, like, yeah, I'm risk averse when it comes to that. Unless you can, unless you can prove you're a talker. I mean, yeah. So, so James has often said that that like you know, he is not the star of the show. But the Ted Knutson show is, is not my show. It is the Ted. <laughs> but I, I think what you'll find and the feedback that I've been getting from traveling around. Is, is one, like people love the podcast, like, on, almost like universally so and unexpectedly so. And you and I found that same thing. Like, yeah. why would we do this? Why would we talk about football? We feel like we I, should write and analyze football. That, that was the most amazing thing, right? When we first started, it was like, people, people want to listen to this. Yeah. Like, we would just, you know, you'd research a piece, right? You'd do a couple of hours of research, you put it up, you post it up, you'd be like, right, that's amazing. They got a couple of retweets, right? Or whatever. It was, sure. it was in the early days. And then we do a very early podcast, and people just like, just love this. Now, now they don't more. talk to us about it unless we don't do it. Yeah, that's true. Right. So it's, it's got to that stage of the relationship, right, where you get nagged if you don't. So we've right? had some. Like this guy's, yeah, he's smiling in the front. He's like talking about movies and things. I, I think I think our underestimation or, or like our misreading of the market there was people are really spectacularly bored, and, and just, also like yeah. to hear people talk with good accents talk about football, and and that's you I and James. Got an it's certainly not me. I haven't got an accent. Your Welsh accent is very strong. Farmer, James. That's what all right. Like. Aha! Farmer. Regular listeners out there, yeah. love it. We got yeah, a chuckle right. for it. Okay, so first question. We've in, got like an hour left, so in, you're gonna have to drift the whole time. In my prep is, <laughs> how was your day, Ted? <laughs> <laughs> my day was great, um, and I, I think in in my opening, I think an awful lot of people, um, or at least some, but like our whole team pitched in on this. Uh, conferences are hard, like they're a logistical nightmare. Uh, I was probably a little loose in organizing my side of it, and so to all of the featured speakers that came in, thank you so much for yeah. dealing with uh, <laughs> with being a little I'm, loose. I'm, a, I'm genuinely impressed how well this has all gone, to be honest. Exactly. <laughs> 
<laughs> so we went in kind of expecting the worst, and, and the fact of the matter is, it has been awesome. And the venue was good, and the food was good. Uh, yeah. but really, like Charlotte, Ali, you know, leading this. Mike Goodman's been upstairs uh, running that room. James ran the room. Uh, all of our people pitched in on this. It was like actually yeah, it's, it's a universal stats bomb effort. Real team effort. Loads and loads of people have done lots here. And yes, I'll, I'll echo uh, praise for Charlotte because uh, she she does so much for stats bomb and doesn't you know doesn't isn't the public face of it as as we see you know like uh, Ted is or maybe. Like Times. Well, and, and, and Hesham is, is basically the equivalent yeah. down at the Arcom on our data group. And, and people, another thing that people do not understand is like how difficult data is to collect and collect it well, especially on the eventing side. Like there, there's, a, there's a spot where like the tracking data steps in and it's all automated and it's sexy and everything like that. <laughs> the eventing side is hard damn work. And, it is, and it's, it's challenging, but like, they have such a good culture there, and we basically, we've had very little turnover in what's quite a difficult job. Uh, we try to continually upgrade our data spec and, and improve things, and it's very much a work in progress. Uh, but, you know, Hasham is, is one of the big contributors there, Ali on the tech side and the business side. So, like, you know, it's, Statsbomb has gone from two dudes, effectively, and the website to being 140 people and uh, a real business. and. You know, thank you so much for believing in us to come here uh, or to watch us, you know, although watching is a little less uh, active uh, <laughs> participation. But like, we didn't know what to expect with this conference. Uh, I said in the, in the intro, we had 55 people that showed up at our global data launch. Uh, and, and that was after inviting uh, probably a couple of hundred from around Europe. Uh, we had a couple hundred today. And that's, you know, 15, 16 months afterwards. And it speaks a little bit about how the world's changing. It speaks a lot about the great people that agreed to give us their time and come present. And it speaks a little bit about how StatsBomb has changed a lot. Okay, I've got an, uh, another question. Hang on, my day was really good. Like, everybody was <laughs> awesome. Okay. How, no, how was his day? My day was good. Wait, excuse me. Oh, were you okay. late? I'll wait. Excuse were you me? late? Yeah. Excuse okay. me? Right. I was, yeah. Okay. Sorry. How was your day James. then? <laughs> right, okay, so there we go. My day, my day was great. I was, I was going to echo a lot of the sentiments here of the, about thanking the. You've been in both rooms. I mean, Ted's uh, yeah. been down here nearly all day, and I've been upstairs. Right. Most of the day. So, so you're, you're, you're the. You're I, the I, moved, I moved between both rooms, and I also tried to find Mauricio Sarri's smoking room somewhere in Chelsea's <laughs> stadium, and I failed. So it's okay. to go outside. Um, but uh, I was just kind of blown away by the, the variety and generally high quality of all the speakers. You know, the smaller room, if any of you guys didn't see it, felt like a bit more like a research. Yeah. Anyway, from no, that it, side. It, I don't it, know how you guys. That was, that was the track. It was right, the, that was the, the idea. Right? You know, put the kind of like you know, yeah. researchers out there. From a few people we selected uh, to go in there, and then we ran the research paper competition. We got seven. I think what we have 10, 10 presenters in there, and then and I think the standard there was like incredibly consistent. You know, I've been to things yeah. like this before, and sometimes you come away and you're like, oh, no, that one wasn't so good. Uh, and it was really consistent and really good across the board. Yeah, and definitely. that's your fault. <laughs> Because, yeah, like, first of all, because <laughs> James and, and Nikos uh, mostly ran, and, and you and ran the research side of it. But also, like when James, when James took over editing the website and then handed it off to Mike, like the mandate was make it good. Like don't put nonsense up, don't put popcorn up. Everything needs to be quality. And he's been so protective of that over the years. Like, not generally to a fault, but like to be honestly true, like that was the big thing that we wanted to do. We could have done anything. It's a website. You could publish anything. But our, our very specific guiding mandate through this whole thing was to make it good. Yeah, I used to, you didn't like the artwork I used to do, did you, Ted? I, I thought your artwork was unique. <laughs> this feels a little bit like your stuff appraisal here, James. This is basically <laughs> thanking you for it. But you know, the, 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 to, to finish it off, the, the day was great. The, the smaller talks, the research talks were all fascinating. They were all of a good quality. The three main talks they had in between before and after lunch were all uh, equally, equally great and different, you know, in their own way. So, you guys, you guys did a really good job. Like all of you, all the stuff. Here, all you guys behind the scenes. Was Kaylee's piece good? Was Kaylee's piece? Good? Yeah, it's a different podcast. The two mics. He I had, it's a double he, he had tough questions. You remember, you know, remember, when you used to post articles on Twitter, right? And then yeah. someone would be like, "Why didn't you think about doing it oh, in X way, or maybe you should have done it in Y Tom, way?" Was Tom in that room? Because Tom was. was the worst co uh, criminal for doing that type of question yeah, at the, the Opta Forum, along with Andrew Stone, who used to be at Southampton, I think works for Kyra and Hager. Right. Man, that dude just like take the kids and put them over the fire and be like, so how would I go talk to a coach about that when you're doing these things? And, yeah. and the kids are just like, 
I just work here, sir. <laughs> no, I but, did but, it for free. But Come on. My, my, Michael uh, Cayley's was great, but he also got questions like, oh, so you split these in Home and Away? And what about the footedness? And have you split all this by game state? And he's just like, well, let's just think about that. But no, he's, he's, his talk was great. I couldn't get into Cayley's talk. That's the one thing I missed <coughs> upstairs apart from what I'm missing now. Because yeah. there, there was, you know, it was standing room only up there. So I kind of stood on the edges and then figured, oh, I can't see this. I've got the slides on my computer well, at home, so <coughs> I don't need to watch it. I think, I, think the, I think the learning curve from next conference is obviously Stats Bomb Conference. Everyone that is definitely interested in the geekier side of stuff, are they? Yeah, that we, was the point, right? that but, was also like slightly unexpected. Yeah. yeah. You like got the research track, and the research track was really well uh, attended yeah, throughout the was, course of the day. It was. I mean, uh, the, the first one of the day, uh, David Podomo and um, uh, his the, his group, it was that was packed as well. Both, you know, after lunch in the first one of the day, absolutely packed. And then slowly people drifted out and you know did other things. People brought their A game. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, it was really good. I mean, you know, like I said, I've, I've enjoyed the day as well, and uh, like just the consistency and, and the effort. Everyone, you know, I'd like to thank for anyone still in the room who you know did present today upstairs. I'd just like to thank you know the effort that you put into you know really do well and explore your topics to the you know most you know the fullest extent that you can. And, you know, you've done yourselves proud, and it's, it's been really good to actually see that and you know be part of this conference. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> I, do, just, I feel protective. I've been communicating with them all for weeks, and like this yeah. is just a loving, just, isn't it? This just, is just, just a hope, just hoping they, just hoping, please. People turn, used please to complain that up. we agreed too often. Please now we're up. being too nice. Uh, the, the, the challenge is talking about football, which you know. Right, so Man United. <laughs> yeah, the um, the <laughs> hand grenade. They, <laughs> they, <laughs> they have a plan to be good at like twenty twenty two. Tot Tottenham's metrics. Ooh. Oh boy! <laughs> Don't look at Tom Patrick. Yeah, oh my God. those are rough. Uh, football is a complicated game, and and football like dealing with. So that, this is one thing that often gets lost. Like you're dealing with humans, and we, we we boil a lot of things down to metrics and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, like you never quite know what's happening behind the scenes. Like humans are complicated by themselves. Humans that you need to perform at the very highest level are, are like deeply complicated it's really difficult to do a lot of this stuff. And I think one of the reasons why like, the early advances happened was because people were so wrong, so badly wrong, that like, we were able to, to do some fairly simple analysis and be like, yeah, you could do better. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I've got a, yeah, I've got, I've, hang on. I've got a question, question what's right and what's wrong though? Yeah, it was basically uh, favorite moments that you got right or wrong right. over the years. So I just want to touch one just on there about metrics and, and teams and all the rest of it. There have been one a couple of years ago, I think this might have been Stats Bomb, but it was also, I can't remember the name of it, I think it's Owen Thomas, he used to be a follower, he used yeah, to follow yeah. Oh yeah, yeah sure, remember it. Cardiff fan. Yeah, and I think it was the one with, I don't remember the season now, with Aston Villa and the manager was... Lambert. Yes, and they went on a start, and it was, I think it went four and one, didn't they, or something like that at the start, yeah, right? Yeah. And then they gave him a new three or four year contract. And it was just so easy going back in the day. It was very basic data, very basic yeah. shot event data, and you know what rate you were converting your chances at. And if you looked at those two things and looked at their schedule and you were like, this isn't a very good team. They've won a couple of uh, fluky games here, and he was rewarded with a three or four year contract. That's funny enough. That was one of the very early ones that I can recall about. That is not good. That's in that's the course. Not good. Though, I mean, good. Fact, there's a couple of people here who came to the course yesterday, and it's one of my examples of like, you know, just, right. don't, just don't react too fast, you know, to yeah. be slow. You yeah, know, yeah, I, think yeah. they, I think they got like 10 points in the first like four games or something, three games. Right, 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 right. And they were taking like six shots a game, Villa, yeah, last season, and, and giving up like 17 or 18. And that's the sim you know, simplest just shots. We're just looking at how of many course. shots there are. Like when, when you're allowing three times the amount of shots, <laughs> it doesn't really matter where they are. I mean, yes, it does. And, and, but, it was just yeah, a kind of and usually look. streaks like that, you know, you forget about them. It's just a three or four game sample within the season. But off the back of that, I remember him being awarded this kind of renewal of a contract or something. It was like, dude, this isn't going to go well. And I don't even think yeah. he made a year, right? He might have not made a no, it twelve they, months. I mean, the, the next season, Sherwood was there, and they, and they went down. But it, yeah. So it was, what it was we would say brilliant. is Aston Villa were really quite well managed at that point, and uh, there was no chaos behind the yeah. scenes. I think there's Alan like Hutton, thirty-two year old Alan Hutton, was one of the four-year deals as well. So everything was going swimmingly. So I, obviously. So, so uh, I think as, as Aston Villa have like come back up or whatever, we, we saw a lot of those old contracts that we first right. like picked that we're like, oh wow, okay, that's finally off the books, and that's finally off the books, and uh, Micah Richards was uh, another. Yeah, it's incredible. <laughs> you just had to go through four or five years just to be able to shift all that. But you know, there's, I think there's, there's few. I remember 
uh, me and you had a famous one about things you might have got wrong or, or right and all the rest of it. I remember we talked about like, a lot about Suarez, didn't we? We talked. Remember? I think you abused me. A lot like, about this, is, this is Suarez at Liverpool. I think it was the, <laughs> would that have been 12th? 13, 11, uh, yeah, 12? so 12, 13 going into 13, 14. And it was the it was the it was the time when Arsenal had the chance to sign him and yeah, didn't yeah. want to pay the extra five dollars or whatever the hell it was to be able to get him. He wasn't know. available. Uh, Come so on. you say. So you they, say. They, they thought that they were gonna uh, get the release clause, and and that was like a fundamental moment where for me, like I initially looked at it in kind of that hockey lens or the American efficiency lens, yeah, where yeah. like you know you need more efficient players, and and efficient players are are sort of by definition like what you need to go for because the game operates as it does in certain structures. Liverpool were approaching kind of like 20 shots a game uh, in that, that time period and, and Suarez was pretty inefficient. But then what we, we realized like very quickly afterwards was that it's being able to generate those chances for yourself or your teammate that is the actual skill, especially if they're pretty good ones. I used that time period also when, when I sort of flipped um, the script on that and started using much more of an XG framework and now we use a lot more sort of passing, completion, uh, deep completions, ball movement, uh, holistic type stuff. But um, the period of time, like the, the two players that I look at also in, in kind of the course or a couple different talks is Andros Townsend and Neymar. Because if you look at those early metrics, uh, Andrews Townsend looks like he might be a little bit better than Neymar. And obviously he didn't play with the same, same sort of players, but nevertheless, like... If this you look, is revelatory, really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and so you're looking at it, you're like, this is really weird, because like same age, you know, Andrews Townsend's taking more shots, he's got more completed dribbles, I think he might even have more, more key passes, which is a, a pass that creates a shot for your teammate. And you're like, all right, so these two players look on the same trajectory. They're both playing for pretty good teams, which we would say Spurs are. They're not Barcelona. And, but then you're like, this guy never scores, and this guy's Neymar. And, and finally, what we did was we were like, all right, so plot the data, look at the shot map. And Andrews Townsend's shot map looks like it's got a force field around the goal, and his stuff only comes from outside the force field. That's not the plot that you want. Uh, and I don't know if Ian Lynham ever showed up, but Ian Lynham, like loves the example of, of shot locations for players tend to be fairly consistent year over year unless like something really disrupts them. This is where that whole teaching thing about, hey, don't take shots from, from really far away comes into play, and you need to get that down to the players, have them police themselves, et cetera. Yeah, but I think that was the, that was the important lesson from that, that Suarez incident, where I was like, I think you should sign him and you'd win the league, Arsenal this was. Yeah. And you were like, I'm not sure because of inefficiency. I don't think either was completely right or wrong, but mm. I think that was probably a really good lesson and a really good point, because back then we only had very basic data. You know, this was probably pre expected goals models mm -hmm. really right you might have just started yeah, to kind of just yeah just started to kind of seep into it but back then it was like how do we evaluate him and i think i was on the case of being like this dude just generates so much he converts at a really shit rate and he wastes so much and possession dies with him so much but i just thought he's such a high event player that this has to be something here but those kind of lessons from specifically plays like that or andros townsend like you just mentioned that was like the backbone to be able to then move forward and say, right, how do we do this better? The, how are we going to evaluate better? Those, uh, the, the Kenny Dalglish season uh, before Rodgers came on board, I think has the, the biggest underperformance of any like, major league in terms of expected really? goals versus, well, well, well. versus actual. Yeah, I mean, I may, I may have been superseded. It's, I, I don't know, but definitely at, around that point. It, it was just like this massive grew, outlier. Grew of, you guys are creating a lot well. of good stuff, but not scoring ever. What the hell happened there? And and, and, but we weird. don't know what it looks like in, in like the new data, and that was another yeah, thing that, that happened along the way. Do you have more questions? I'm not sure. I was just going to yeah, I was just going to make the point of like you know things you got right and things you got wrong. Oh yeah, thing, sure. Thing I got wrong. The world conspired against me. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, that's also possible. Uh, yeah. I, writing articles for like the best part of like a year saying Leicester won't win the league. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I, oh, you weren't yeah. alone though, I don't think, really. <laughs> yes. You weren't alone there. That their was... numbers are not good enough. They're not going to win the league. Are, then, are they going to win the league this year? Uh, no, the numbers aren't good enough, Ted. Okay. <laughs> yeah, funnily <laughs> enough. <Hang> on. <laughs> Who has the best numbers in the league this year? Uh, Man City. Yeah, but this is the in interesting question. Yeah. Because like, their attacks are like, really skewing high. In a, like, you know, insanely high, but there's a couple of games that are like, oh yeah, Liverpool, Liverpool are intriguing to me because they're, they're just consistent. Like their defensive metrics, even though they've, they've gone up a little bit this season, like, they're just consistent. Those guys have to break at some point. That is Palm true. Play, or guys. the flip side is the models aren't good enough to measure everything that they're doing. I don't know, five, you, you talk about fullbacks playing 5,000 minutes a season like they did last year, and you <laughs> carry on doing it, and you carry on doing it. Well, as a Man City fan, I'm hoping at some point some of those guys. Break. Like, 
it's nice that you guys have to use all of the depths that you purchased over the years. I think that that feels like something that should be enforced. You have to actually play your second stream team that yeah. you, you paid 35 million or more for on a regular basis. But in, in kind of Man City's defense, if you go back to the end of last season. Man City what, what, are struggling in defense. I think that's right. exactly what we're talking yeah, about. Exactly, this is what I'm saying. <laughs> but if you go back to last season, their three main center backs, Laporte, Company, and Stones, probably. I think Otamendi was number four and going to get shipped out. They're all gone. I can't remember another club that's had this where your, your first three centre backs are just wiped off the slate, basically. I for think months Laporte, and months Laporte's and months. An, interesting, an interesting question because a couple of people have mentioned Laporte today is, and you know, showing up in data in different kind of, uh, different kind of ways, like passing and um, just, uh, like, just how he fits in linking together with other players and stuff. And it's, it's very much a case of like, you know, you only miss, miss it once it's gone. And like people are really understanding like oh, actually, actually Laporte was, you know, really, really high class centre back and then Man City are missing him enormously. I mean, I, I looked at something to do with like kind of passing and carrying and like the amount of like distance that he's, he's, he's kind of like, <clears throat> you know, progressing the ball. And he, he came up really well and it was like, okay. Yeah, mate. You know, and then you see, and then you see Man City, Man City kind of like uh, look, looking a little bit pe like Pep Year One, and it's Otamendi, and it's just it's the same <laughs> the same people that were looking like course, a little bit. Yeah, and you've got you've got Pep Fernandinho playing left centre back as a right footer who has never ever played in defence before. Uh, yeah, if you want some entertainment, go and watch Man City in the next month or so. Exciting. It is. It, it'll be exciting, one way or the other, going defensively or offensively. It's funny that you mentioned the the sort of like Laporte's impact and Stones' impact in like opening play. And opening play is like so important for City to be able to progress at, and not lose in in situations that they're they're uncomfortable with or they don't have sort of defensive shape protection. Uh, we had this experience at Brentford at a much much lower level, but we signed a couple of of center backs that could open play. And it was like hugely important to us to be able to do that because like we didn't want to stress like, uh, especially in the championship, very physical, a lot of games, uh, not always the best pitches, although I think that they're all pretty good now. But like we wanted to be able to, to be able to play a particular style and, and also like a, a little more run and gun style than, than a lot of um, teams typically had. And then we went through like a series of head coaches that for various reasons, none of which actually involved me. Uh, I just want to make that clear. Um, but but uh, we kept having to explain to the coaches why like you really want to play these guys and not these other guys and and there were times when Harley Dean and um, oh God I'm forgetting I, Egan played a, at a later point but there were times when we had the two center backs playing that like could not open play and like our defense our offensive metrics like really suffered and our defensive metrics suffered because the ball would come right fucking back at you. And like that's a huge thing, and that's where the context comes into play. You have players that you need to make these types of passes, and they need to make good decisions with the ball. And suddenly, if you're pressuring them, and the ball's going in bad directions, and it's coming right back yeah. at you, like the whole thing falls apart. Mm. And I think this is something which will probably open up in football over the next couple of years. And like recently, it's only just opened up in hockey. They really call it zone exits in hockey. If you zone exit cleanly. What does it do? It sets your entire team up to go and have sustained possession, to generate shots, and it just sets your whole attack up. This, it, football, you can, you can skin a cat in many different ways. You can, you can long ball it like Burnley if you want to, but I think the game is definitely moving towards having those defenders being able to set play up, to open play, to open midfield, open the channels up, and move forward in that way. And I think it's going to be ever increasingly that way. It's, it's going to move towards that for sure. I think the thing that I'm, I'm happiest with kind of on the site like long term, and it's actually kind of more of a project that happened inside our club. Is like I'm just so proud of the set pieces stuff. Uh, you find a wrinkle that that really hasn't been touched, and and you exploit it, and then you do it again, and you revise it, and you do it again. And the stuff that we did with Mitchelland and and advised it with Mitchelland in like 14, 15, 15, 16, uh, which helped us win a title, and and almost certainly helped them win a second title after I was gone. Um, you know, that was like. Uh, an early version and the stuff that you see in the the set piece course now is is like much more refined and way broader what set piece course the one that we stopped <laughs> teaching uh that we may teach again in spanish so uh, there'll be extra special challenges there but i it, it's fun to like find ways to break the game like right? that's that's like so cool and and yeah you know, i talked a little bit to, to vasa earlier like what brings you joy and it is that that sort of process of discovery and then Iterating it and finding and testing it and finding out you were right, um, and and so like football has been so backwards about set pieces. Uh, even even the teams that were successful, like have often lost bits of that or like don't have the whole picture. 
And, and so like, that's been you know, particularly enjoyable. And one reason why we taught it this summer was just to like, stop arguing about it. Like, look, we're pretty sure we're right. Like, come see the course or don't and, uh, and find out. And we had great feedback. And, and I think teaching has always been a thing that we do on the site, like explaining it to a general public, but in a way that expects a lot of the readers. Uh, we didn't dumb it down to be impossibly dumb. Like we expected, you know, if you're going to come in and have a conversation and learn from us, you've got to at least do some of the work in order to understand it. Okay. What brings you joy, Ted? What sparks joy? What sparks joy? <laughs> uh, these days, new customers. <laughs> a fine craft beer, maybe at the end of a hard day. Oh, certainly. That's that's definitely true. Ah, as my waistline has often said, uh, my, my hairline is mostly from working with you. <laughs> uh, the gray in the beard is a bit of my children, but mostly still you. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think I still love recruitment. I, I like genuinely love it. And I love that moment where you get like 10 games or, or 15 games into the season and you really kind of dip into the data set and you're looking at the new season stuff from all sorts of leagues that you don't necessarily pay attention to. And you're like, who might be good? You know, you're looking for like some young kids or even some older guys. So we did a project that like <laughs> Teji Savanier showed up when he was in League de, uh, and, and we we're like, this guy actually is interesting enough to yeah. flag up. And then the next year he goes up to League Un and actually is really good. And you're like, shit, we still got it. You know, it was fun. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's kind of funny. We, we still, still, I still think to be cautious about like, you know, evaluating the season too early on. Uh, what well, we are, week eight, round, round most of Europe, and everyone's, everyone's already got their take set. We know yeah. exactly what's going on. So nothing ever that. changes. Yeah. Remember, yeah. the top six is inviolable. Uh, that, you know, they're, no one's ever going to penetrate that, because that was the, the, yeah, the, the yeah, narrative yeah. around this time last year. And we're looking at it, and you're like, man, a lot of these teams are not great. And it's well, that, that was interesting, here, yeah. though, wasn't it? Because that was, that was quite a unique situation, so far as, um, I think, at least uh, Tottenham, Man United, and Arsenal all kind of, like, ballooned over their metrics in the first half of last season. Chelsea didn't, but their metrics were okay, and Man City and Liverpool were just Man City and Liverpool. So it was, yeah, you looked at the league table, and it was like, oh, my God, the top six are just invincible and but there were you know there were warning signs in the metrics to that have brought us to this stage we're at today where you know you actually look um you know you look at the, the teams that aren't liverpool the teams that aren't liverpool and that's it yeah but yeah, well, well, Sp like, spurs okay. are very much cooperating by having their own Mourinho year three season which is oh, like man. a bit unexpected look at his face look how <laughs> he looks this is crestfall. two times Mourinho equals one times Pochettino yeah I don't know yeah six years it's, it's, it's six. a weird one and and you know their recruitment looked pretty good but they had some holes but like you can't explain it easily at, at the moment um so you like you've been in and out of this for a while I know that right. you've did some uh, like you used to do a lot of youth uh, analysis kind of on the side quietly. Yes, yeah, used to do that, but... Um, ben, ben was often our line into like, who's good coming out of City? And not only who's good, but when I was at a football club, I was like, who might we want to get on loan? <laughs> yeah, I think I recommended a couple of good ones. One of them might play for Celtic these days. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, my origin with the site was obviously when we first started, it was a lot of writing and a lot of kind of analysis and, and doing the rest of it. but. I think for me, who hasn't written anything for a long time now, I think the same with someone like Colin as well, for example, I think there comes a certain point where once that low fruit that we talked about early on, once that low fruit has kind of gone away, it requires ever more research and ever more time to be yeah. able to drag out any kind of like genuine insights. And I think that comes for me anyway, for my life, I was living in sunny Barcelona and quite enjoying sitting on the beach every day kind of thing. So it came a, it came a point in my life where I was like, do I want to go and burn X amount of hours here trying to tease something out that might not get there? Um, so that was kind of, that was the end of my writing. And then luckily around the same time, we kind of did the podcast and then this was so much easier. Yeah. So that was, yeah. that was the joy of a podcast, <laughs> right? You know, you rock up five minutes before and you're like, hey, what's going on? And there used to be, there used to be occasional night ones with Ted where you'd have a, a craft ale or a, or a light cider or something like that. A light cider? I don't know. Like Come that. on! So that was that was that tended to be. How way dare you impinge me like that? that, that, that tended, Someone that might have a light anything. cider after this. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> do yeah. they have uh, light ciders? Well, <laughs> cause lights, I think, in the, in the hotel bar. That, I'm that not Kyle right. Bodie, okay, uh, and that's also. So Kyle Bodie is one of the pioneers in American um, baseball player development, and but yeah, he's. You should definitely go check out Driveline Bases. He now has a, a job as, I guess, head of pitching development for the Cincinnati Reds. That's interesting though, because he had, he, he very much like, had, I wouldn't, I don't know much about how he got this job, but I would imagine he had like, 
not necessarily the pick of the jobs, but he very much was able to probably wait and take the right job. Sure, yeah? and, because and, he was pretty influential. And when you're really good stuff. at it, like you, you get some some level of choice. So James, what sparks joy? What sparks joy? Uh, five p.m. on a fright? No, not five p.m. on a fright. <laughs> I like my job. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. You're almost there. <laughs> a lion on a Saturday morning. That's a point. Are we on overtime? Is it uh, past five on a Friday? We are at 1718. Oh, oh, my God. See, yeah. Billy. No, that's okay. What's Bark's job? I don't know. I mean, I always used to, I used, always used to write, like writing the stories that I did. It was good fun. I don't do it as much anymore. And, you know, People I, complain I, that you don't do the roundup. They, they <laughs> love the roundup. That was good. That was good fun. And, uh, you know, it, so we actually those, did that private. Those thing, are right? always those. Are the, I used to do the yeah. round before James did, yeah, yeah. and those were always the most fun ones to do. Small yeah. bullet yeah. points. Here's a video. Here's a little breakdown of what a team did. Here's a little stat line. Not the video. Not the video. Um, but yeah, you know, yeah, kind of uh, <laughs> fuzzed out video. Um, those were always the most fun ones, right? Yeah, and you, it, uh, you know, I've got you. To, you know, I've got you to thank for a lot, and I've got you to thank for the fact that I even wrote one in the first place because you once tweeted out like, "Has anyone done a roundup?" Yeah, yeah. nobody yeah. replied. And to I think I think uh, Ted found me like, originally. I could do that. <laughs> and the, the bitter in blue days through having that that ten points or whatever it was called or ten points roundup, yeah. and that was like a gateway. Like, oh look, you can tell these little short stories and you know, kind of multiple ones every week. So. They, yeah, I agree with James there. They used to spark joy. They're, they're a good thing to do. Yeah, it was, it was good fun. You know, I should I should write, write more about it. And you know, I mean, you've got quite good data access these days. Allegedly, enough. I know <laughs> nothing about the old, it. Compared to the yeah. old days, I mean, I used to, you know, I, I came up the hard way, Ted, down in the mines, you know, transcribing <laughs> things out of his Hang on, on, the Chinese audience doesn't like that. We heard that with Honigstein earlier. <laughs> Schalke, zero fear or whatever, like no fear. The, the Chinese complained about the whole Schalke mining thing, and so right. they changed how they, they brand the, com the club as they expanded. So uh, okay. uh, if, if, we're, if we're broadcasting in China right now, less oh. about the mines. Just tell us about you know, the, the uphill into the wind both, both ways of your, of your stats youth. Talking of broadcasting, what's about swearing? Are we like, you know, we're not, we're before the watershed and we're broadcasting, surely we're... You're we're, not allowed to swear before then at like any point? I don't know. We'll find out now when we get well, fined. You were on the previous panel. Did you talk anything about the swearing? I, I was, was fantastic. I, I was next to Emma. I knew it was happened. <laughs> I, it, it was always baked in the cards. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, swearing on the podcast, there's always, always been a little bit of it. I could, you're very adamant that, you know, you will, you will be yourself. Uh, I think if you if you hear me swear on the podcast, then it's then I'm Seriously. being quite passionate about something. We got That's, a we got a request the movie section. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we, we got a request from somebody via Eventbrite, and they wanted to know if uh, if if it was 18 and over for the the whole of the the conference. We didn't really know how to answer that because we knew that the podcast would be involved. But I don't think that we say anything that is 18 and over. Like you know maybe maybe PG 13 is kind of. We've, we've had that for one of the courses, actually. Someone asked about, you know, if they could, if they could send, like, their son or something, because he was interested in it. And it was like, right, okay, we're we crash. I mean, what are we doing here? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Can I look after children? He was not, like, <laughs> come on. It, it's actually cool, though. Like, kids are, kids are interested. And, yeah. and you're seeing, you know, some real passion there. And you could talk to, to high school kids uh, or whatever, the secondary school kids here, and they, they certainly will be interested. And yeah. you know, sometimes I don't want to suggest to them that this is a career path that you want to take. Uh, you should definitely steer them towards like the degenerate gambling career path that many of my friends have done. But yeah, that, that'll definitely <laughs> that'll definitely be a new thing as well, wasn't it? Because I think when uh, some of us guys had started, you'd be kind of mid late twenties, a little bit bored, kind of digging around and something. So to think now that there's probably fifteen or sixteen year olds coming up, genuinely interested yeah. in the work that's gone before and the kind of framework that's gone yeah, before. Yeah, you know, it's learning, super learning, exciting. Um, learning, you know, R or Python and yeah. getting data. You know, we put out lots of data. You know, if, if, if I was a high school teacher or something. Right now, and I was running some kind of like computer project. I'd be like, "Go get some stats from football data. You yeah, can play yeah, right. You can yeah, do yeah, some yeah. really cool things, and that would be quite engaging, you know." Cool. All right. Well, that ends the Stats Bomb Innovation in Football Conference. I want to thank all of you for attending, all of you for watching. If you watched on the live stream, if you're watching this at home after the fact, you know, thank you again. 